Good morning. I want to welcome you to Williams Creek Baptist Church. And what an honor it is to gather back again uh, together uh, to worship and lift up the name of the Lord. And at the heart of our psalm this morning is that very purpose, uh, the call to praise the Lord and to worship Him. Matter of fact, uh, the text, the psalm, Psalm 111 begins in verse 1, praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart in the company of the upright in the assembly. So we continue this morning together in our journey through the book of Psalms. And as we come to this text this morning, uh, we're talking about the reality of worship. Now James Hamilton, he writes that the Psalms recount the history of Israel from David to exile. And then they look beyond the exile to the new Davidic king who will arise and lead the people back to the land, the land of promise. The story of Israel's past and the expression of hope for her future are centered on the glory of God and salvation through His righteous judgment. Yahweh's praise is obviously central in the Psalms. He is praised as He judges Israel for their turning away from him and his word into sin. And through that judgment, Israel looks beyond exile to future salvation, which is accomplished by Yahweh's agent of redemption, Israel's Messiah. And we've, we've talked about this Messiah uh, through the Psalms over our time together. And we recognize that that was fulfilled, that the, the coming of the Messiah was fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so, at the heart of our text uh, th- this morning is uh, the call of God's people to worship and to praise His name. And so, as, as we gather here this morning, uh, we gather uh, as an assembly of God's people. And that's, that's who this call was going out to in terms of Israel as they were gathered together. Uh, the Psalm 111 is a calling to the company of the upright to assemble together and to worship and praise the Lord together. So, who is this company of the upright? Why are they gathered and assembled together? And why do they do what they do? Uh, these are just some of the questions uh, that we will consider this morning as we assemble together ourselves to worship and praise the Lord. And so join with me, if you will, to Psalm, turn in Psalm 111, and we'll read all, first four, or all uh, ten verses together. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. In the company of the upright and in the assembly, great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. Splendid and majestic is His work, and His righteousness endures forever. He has made His wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He has given food to those who fear Him. He will remember His covenant forever. He has made known to His people the power of His works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of His hands are truth and justice. All His precepts are sure. They are upheld forever and ever. They are performed in truth and in uprightness. He has sent redemption to His people. He has ordained His covenant forever, holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you for the gift of redemption. And Lord, we have come to know that redemption through your Son, Jesus Christ. Israel was looking forward into the future. Uh, based on your prophetic word and the description of the Messianic King as he would arrive and come and bring redemption upon them as a nation. But Lord, we have seen that the broader reality of that and the coming of Jesus Christ 
and that he has come not only to uh, redeem people from Israel, but from among the nations of the world. And we are named among those. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you. And, and your call to worship is, is not just to a call, a specific call to a specific day uh, with regards to your people Israel, but this call continues on. As we have gathered here, the assembly of the upright. Upright because, Lord, by your grace and by your mercy, you have made us right, righteous in your standing because of the righteousness of your Son. So God, help us as we come to this text this morning. And Lord, that we may see the application of, of these truths in our lives. It's in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. And amen. Well, the psalmist is setting forth a call. And this call is to the worship of the Lord. That's the first principle in terms of this calling that we find here this morning. But secondly, uh, for us to recognize the works of the Lord or remember and to study the works of the Lord as we will see. And then finally, uh, a text that we have touched on before as we looked at Psalm 112 with, with the man of God or the godly man or the godly um, man or woman uh, who would fear the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so the worship of the Lord, the works of the Lord, and the fear of the Lord as we see this call upon God's people, Israel, and as we understand it for our day. First, we begin there with the worship of the Lord. And we see there, it is an exhortation, a, it is a, a charge given to the entire uh, assembly of the, the people of God. And that, that, that charge or that call or that exhortation is praise the Lord. And as we noted in our study of Psalm 112, uh, that word for praise the Lord comes uh, from um, the word Hallel, mean praise, and then with the, connected with the Lord, uh, Jehovah, uh, hallelujah. In other words, uh, when we gather, we are declaring the praise of the Lord and declaring hallelujah. And He is uh, certainly uh, the, the, the direct object of our praise when we come together. Praise the Lord, uh, He calls us, the psalmist does. And D.A. Carson, he clarifies that with regards to the verb uh, that is used here in terms of praise, um, uh, should, should we not remind ourselves that worship, he says, is a transitive verb? And a transitive verb is a verb that requires a direct object. We do not meet to worship, that is, to experience worship. We meet to worship God. Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. There is the heart of the matter. In this area, one must confuse, not, not confuse what uh, is central with the byproducts. If you seek peace, you will not find it. If you seek Christ, you will find peace. If you seek joy, you will not find it. If you seek Christ, you will find joy. If you seek holiness, you will not find it. If you seek Christ, you will find holiness. If you seek experience, experiences of worship you will not find them if you worship the living God you will experience something of what it what is reflected here in the Psalms worship is a transitive transitive verb and the most important thing about a transitive verb is the direct object therefore God is the direct object of our praise here in Psalm uh, 111 verse 1 now, with regards to uh, this declaration, this call, this exhortation uh, of praise and hallelujah uh, to the Lord, uh, the Lord, uh, He reveals, um, as, as we see here, uh, we re He reveals His salvation through His Messianic King. The reason why we praise the Lord is because of the realities of who He is and in, in the fact that he has redeemed a people for his own possession. Now in Psalm 110, we talked about this. We, we talked about the reality of the Davidic king. 
That is the Messiah that was to come. And so I, I want you to know, as, as we go from Psalm 110 into Psalm 111, uh, we see the message of Psalm 110 becomes the foundation for the praise of the Lord that the call uh, unfolds in Psalm 111 and in Psalm 112. Well, what does Psalm 110 say? We see there, um, beginning in verse 1 of Psalm 110, uh, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power in holy array from the womb of the dawn. Your youth are to you as the dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of His wrath. He will judge among the nations. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter their chief men over a broad country. He will drink from the brook by the wayside. Therefore, He will lift up His head. And so, what the Lord is revealing in Psalm 110, what He is declaring and He is prophesying concerning is the coming of the Messiah. That is a king that has, has, is going to, to reign in terms of the Davidic throne or on, the, on the throne of David, not temporarily, but forever. And we find throughout the New Testament, um, these, these verses were fulfilled and they, they, were, they were quoted and recognized uh, in the context of Jesus Christ, the Son of God who was born in Bethlehem of, of Mary um, and, and uh, his earthly father, Joseph. And he would go on to, to grow up uh, and begin his earthly ministry. And for three years, he would go around in and, and preaching and teaching signs and wonders, miraculous signs and wonders, uh, making the declaration, making the connection uh, to the reality that he is this messianic king. And so when when. The, the psalmist is saying in Psalm 111, verse uh, 1, praise the Lord. Uh, it, it is a response to this future coming of redemption through uh, Jesus Christ, the Messianic King. And we, we just see it there. We see it uh, again. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart and the company of the upright and the assembly. What are we praising the Lord for? Um, we see it there in verse 110. Uh, you know, this or chapter or chapter Psalm 110. Uh, this redemption, uh, this redeemer, this king who is coming to reign, this Messiah. And then we see beyond chapter uh, chapter 111 with regards to that praise, we see this ongoing exhortation, this this call. Uh, for God's people to assemble, to assemble together in praise to the Lord. And we see it there in Psalm 112, verse 1. Praise the Lord. How blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. Or in Psalm 113, 1. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Or in Psalm 117, 1. Praise the Lord, all nations. Laud him, all peoples. And then in Psalm 118, verse 1, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His loving kindness is everlasting. And we've noted as we've walked through these Psalms, anytime you see the reference to the loving kindness of the Lord, that the loving kindness is everlasting, it is associated with His salvation, His redemption of His people. And that is everlasting. His loving kindness, it, it, it represents... Um, his, his election, His choosing of a people for His own possession based on His love. Not on the fact that we were lovable. That we had done anything that God would choose us uh, for salvation. Uh, no, um, His choosing of a people for His own possession is based on His love. And His love is everlasting. And His loving kindness is His loving mercy. His loving grace. And so we see this unfold, that this call immediately, uh, when, when we ask, you know, when we are asking the question, you know, with regards to uh, why are these people gathered together here? 
Now, to answer that question, is they're gathering to worship the Lord who has redeemed them and given them the promise of a future redemption in a messianic king. And so uh, there is much to praise about the Lord. Once, once we get to Psalm 110 and we get that definitive look at the coming of the Messiah, then the Psalms are just exploding with uh, declarations of praise to the Lord for that reason. And so we see that uh, in terms of this uh, exhortation going to uh, the assembly, that is the company of the upright. We're going to see that here in just a minute. But we, we note that the psalmist, he begins by saying to the entire gathering of people, all the peoples are to praise the Lord. And then he immediately makes the declaration of his worship individually, his personal praise. Uh, when he says, praise the Lord, I I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. And so we, we see this declaration. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. It is a personal relationship. It is a personal um, uh, choice to, to praise and lift up the name of the Lord. And again, when he says with all my heart, this goes all the way back to the call of the Lord uh, in terms of Israel, as they are instructed in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verses 4 and 5, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And then you see it in verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with, with all your might. And so when the psalmist is saying, you know, he has given this word in this song, uh, to declare to the people of God uh, in the assembly, he is declaring to all the people of, of the Lord, praise the Lord. We need to worship the Lord. We need to praise Him for His redemption and for the coming of His Messiah. We need to praise the Lord. But then he goes, and, and he, by his own example, based on his love and his passion for God in his, in his heart, in his soul, and his mind, he, he declares, I, I will give thanks. Thanks is, is um, it connects with praise. To, to give praise is to give thanks and to, to acknowledge and lift up the name of the Lord and to declare His glory. So the psalmist is leading out the people as he is, as he is charging them, as he's instructing them to praise the Lord, he is leading them as praising the Lord Himself with all of his own heart. And then we see that with regards to the company of the upright uh, and in the assembly. Well, who are these people? Well, okay, we can say that, that these are the people of God. These are, these are Israelites that have gathered together. Uh, but what we recognize is that, that one of the, the things that God has determined with regards to worshiping Him is that something that not only that we do it individually, like what we see the psalmist is doing here, that he is worshiping uh, and giving thanks to the Lord with all of his heart, that is all of, of his being and who he is and his, his mind, his strength, and all that he is, he is lifting up the name of the Lord, but this is something that we do collectively. People may, may ask, you know, what are, what are people doing when they are gathered together in churches on Sunday mornings if, you know, throughout the world? What, what's going on there? Well, we, we are called to corporate worship. And we see that, that, that there is praise, this call to praise the Lord and this leader who is leading out the people in the praise of the Lord, and he's doing it where? In the company of the upright. Well, who are, uh, who is this company of the upright? Well, these are the people uh, that have been made right by God. In other words, um, you know, in terms of, of their standing with God, God is alone is, is the one that can make them right. And, and that's what we find in terms of our own personal relationship with the Lord. That if we are to draw near to God, the only way that we can do that is through Jesus Christ, His Son. That He was perfect, without sin, holy in righteousness, and because of His sacrifice, uh, His righteousness becomes our righteousness. He makes us right before God. Righteous uh, in terms of our relationship with God so that we might, we might draw, not, draw near to Him. 
come into his presence. Charles Spurgeon clarifies that the company of the upright refers to all those who belong to the Lord, those who are saved by his righteousness. He goes on to say that all, all ye his saints unite in adoring Jehovah. In other words, um, he is saying that one of the things that the people of God do on a regular basis, it is the call of God upon uh, the collective body is to gather together in assembly and to collectively, uh, corporately worship and lift up his name. So all ye saints, all ye his saints, unite in adoring Jehovah, who works so gloriously. Do it now. Do it always. Do it heartily. Do it unanimously. Do it eternally. Even if others refuse. Take care that you have always a song for your God. Put away all doubt, question, murmuring, and rebellious sin, and give yourselves up to the praising of the Lord, both with your lips and with your lives. And so, you know, when we begin to, to think about what, what's happening, I mean, there was an ongoing, steady schedule of life uh, that we see in terms of, of the life uh, of, of Israel. Uh, God had uh, spoke concerning their days that six days uh, out of a week they could work, but on, on the seventh day that they would rest. And that rest, that was to be resting in Him and to be gathered corporately praising His name. And so uh, we see that in, in terms of uh, this ongoing reality with regards to the people of God known as the church. Except in, in our day, uh, once we see the formation of the church begin in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, uh, they were meeting, they began meeting on the Lord's day. And the Lord's day is the first day of the week. It, it's known as the Lord's day because um, it, the, the, that day was the day that Christ rose up from the grave. It was the third day from his, the point of his death, but that third day was the first day of the week, Sunday. And so historically, uh, and we just see that throughout the, the New Testament, uh, that on the, on the first day of the week, when you assemble together, we just see that over and over. Paul, in his instruction with, with regards to uh, when the church was gathered together, when you assemble together, when you get together on the first day of the week, so we see from, from the Scriptures that the church, the New Testament church, those who belong to Christ are gathered together and they are worshiping the Lord. And, and so, for instance, Paul, he, he would write with regards to uh, their gathering, for instance, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, that when they gathered together corporately in their worship, uh, he, would he would instruct them in verse 16 of Colossians 3, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. In other words, um, you know, you should be studying the word of God. You should be teaching the word of God. You should be listening, public reading, uh, the public reading and declaration of scripture, the preaching of it. So let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Let, let the word of Christ govern your life and govern, govern your gathering together. And that's why we're so um, uh, dedicated to the proclamation and the teaching of God's Word here at Williams Creek Baptist Church. Uh, because that is the exhortation of Paul as we gather together uh, that we would uh, let the Word of Christ richly dwell within us and we do so by preaching His Word, declaring His Word, reading His Word, praying his word, or gathering around the table according to His Word. His Word uh, revealed uh, in that, that the Lord's Supper. But He goes on to say that you know, not only to let the Word of Christ richly dwell within you, but with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness. <coughs> there's there's a praise uh, of the Lord and declaration of the Lord. And he says, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And this is exactly what the psalmist is saying. 
in terms of his own personal leadership as, as he is gathering the people to worship and as he is calling them to praise the Lord, he says, I, I will give thanks uh, to the Lord with all my heart. And that's what Paul is calling us to do as we are singing uh, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with what? With thanksgiving. Thankfulness. Where? In your hearts. To who? The object of our worship the Lord God. And so, that is the gathered church. As a matter of fact, we are cautioned. We are warned. And I I want you to know that that with regards to um, worship, uh, worship uh, in in our day and and, and time, for some, worship is just this event that is scheduled uh, on, a we- on a weekly basis, whether on a Sunday morning or a Sunday morning, a Sunday evening, and people gather, they gather to worship there in that location. That is an event. That is a scheduled event. But it's, it's not just a scheduled event. It's, it is a time that we gather together, but it, you know, we gather to worship, to lift up the name of the Lord. And, and we find here that uh, in our day, you know, the, the writer of Hebrews from his day forward, is warning us, is cautioning us, is calling us to guard um, the confession of our faith and the hope that we have, and then to guard our assembling as we are gathered or to, to gather together. We see there in, in, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And then in verse 25, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And I would would state uh, the reality, the condition of our churches today, that we, we are seeing a languish, as it would be stated, or a uh, kind of a, a lapse in our gathering together more and more as the day draws near, as opposed to um, being committed and fully devoted to gathering together uh, as the day draws near. And the day that's drawing near is the coming of Christ. And so in our day, uh, we, we should see a, a movement, uh, a, a commitment to gathering together all the more and not forsaking that, and yet we see great challenge against that. People are, uh, are, are not keeping uh, in, in terms of, of guarding um, that time and that assembling together that they're, and they just have a notion that they can just take it or leave it. And the Lord is, is calling us uh, to take it and, and to guard it and to go hard after it as brothers and sisters in the Lord, that we would gather together and be determined and faithful to gather together according to the word that he has given us here. In his book, Brothers, We Are Not Professionals, John Piper describes worship as follows. The authenticating inner essence of worship is being satisfied with Christ, prizing Christ, cherishing Christ, treasuring Christ in our hearts. This is tremendously relevant for our understanding of what worship services should be about. They are about going hard after God. When we say that what we do on Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings is to go hard after God, what we mean is that we are going hard after satisfaction in God. We are going hard after God as our prize. We are going hard after God as our treasure, our soul food, our heart's delight, our spirit's pleasure. Or to put it, or to put Christ in his rightful place, it means that we are going hard after all that God is for us in Jesus Christ, crucified and risen. Now, this definition of worship gives the church an anchor. In the storms. And let me just pause there for a moment and, and just say that you know, the season in which we find ourselves in world history is definitely storm like. We are walking through 
storms with regards to this pandemic and other things that are unfolding in terms of our world as we speak. So this definition, and that is going hard after God and coming to, to God as the object of our worship, um, this serves as the anchor uh, for the church in such storms as we find in world history. It helps immensely to be able to say what it is all about. Why do we do what we do? The answer, we do it to express or awaken genuine heartfelt satisfaction in all that God is for us in Christ. Nothing keeps God at the center of worship like the biblical conviction that the essence of worship is deep, heartfelt satisfaction in Him, and the conviction that the pursuit of that satisfaction is why we gather together. Now, nothing makes God more supreme and more central than when a people are utterly persuaded that nothing, not money or prestige or leisure or family or job or health or sports or toys or friends is going to bring satisfaction to their aching hearts besides God. This conviction breeds a people who passionately long for God on Sunday morning. They are not confused about why they are here. And so we gather. The reason why we gather together is to praise the Lord. And it is, it is a corporate endeavor and a corporate calling that the, the people who belong to God are gathering together with one voice under uh, the leadership of His Word, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving to the Lord. With what? With all of our hearts. That is the worship of the Lord. And yet, he goes on to uh, describe the realities of that worship as uh, forged, as it were, or as fueled, maybe a better word, through the works of the Lord. He says that the works of the Lord are great there in verse 2. Great are the works of the Lord. And so in, in general, when, when we see that description uh, unfold there as we do here in this psalm as it has unfolded in other psalms that we've looked at uh, when we t when we talk about the you know, great are the works of the Lord uh, we're talking about the works of salvation or works of that is of creation he, he specifically notes uh, redemption and salvation here uh, in just a few verses but in initially he's talking about uh, great are the works great is the creation all of creation that, 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 that the Lord has um, created. And he says that of this, um, they are studied. And who are they studied by? When you look at creation. And when I was away for vacation uh, last week, uh, one of the things that I, I just uh, marvel at are flowers. I, I don't do well at growing flowers, but I certainly enjoy looking at flowers, all shapes and sizes, different colors. I mean, it's just an amazing part of God's creation. And I, I always, if I, if I come across some flowers, uh, oftentimes I'll, I'll go and take a picture of those flowers. I, I study them. I look. Matter of fact, uh, as I was uh, zeroing, uh, zooming in on one particular flower there in Louisville, Kentucky, where I was at, at this one area, this one uh, house, uh, you know, it was a gardens there. Um, so I was out there just looking at those flowers. Here comes a, a bumblebee, and just you know, just see the the marvel of creation unfolding there. That you know that that bumblebee and its work in terms of uh, pollination, cross pollination, and those flowers are there, and just how all this has come together. God has accomplished this, and I mean, and just in my uh, mind, I was delighting in this creation. I was praising God. Uh, as I was taking these pictures, and certainly my pictures, uh, a photograph, um, can't even come close uh, to the real thing. But I'm, uh, I'm just studying uh, God's creation. Great are the works of the Lord, and they are studied by all who delight in them. In other words, they become fuel and passion for our worship. That, that when we uh, see that, um, that the Lord has created all things, and we recognize that, uh, every time we, we cast our gaze upon a sunset or a rainbow uh, or uh, a, a majestic 
uh, vista of, of a mountain range, we, we, we recognize that that was divinely created by the one true God that we worship. So the works of the Lord are great. But then he goes on to say that the work of the Lord is splendid and majestic. And as, as we think about that, you know, we, we think of the, the, the splendid and, and the majesty, uh, the splendor and majesty of, of his works and his righteousness endures forever. That all of, all of what he has created is tied to who he is, to who he is as God and that he is righteous and that his righteousness endures forever. And then he goes on to say uh, that with regards to these wonders, his, these works, that he made his wonders to be remembered. And it's interesting that in verses 4 and 5, it begins the, there with that he made his wonders, that is his works, um, to be remembered. That is his handiwork, his wonders that are done by his power. And then he, he ends verse 5 with he will remember his covenant forever. And, you know, in terms of, of the covenant itself, the covenant itself is a work, and, the, and, in, and that covenant is a work of redemption. So we look at the handiwork of God in terms of creation, and God has ordained that these wonders, His wonders, be remembered. And then uh, one of the things that uh, He remembers, uh, not only are His works of creation, uh, that he, he has named the stars and numbered them and all of creation. He knows all things. Uh, and they are the handiwork of, of his power and authority and, and creation. Uh, but that he will remember his covenant forever. And, and God is the one who has accomplished the work of that covenant um, by which you know, his people Israel would, would be redeemed. But then ultimately through the covenant of the blood of Christ that that this would come to full fruition, not only for God's people Israel, but for the Gentile nations as He is calling men and, and women from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people uh, throughout the earth and throughout history since the coming of Christ. So the wonders of the Lord are made to remember. And so, you know, when, when, we, when we say, so, so, so for instance, from Colossians 3.16, let the Word of Christ richly dwell within you what we are doing is we are remembering we are remembering because uh, what the word reveals the, the word reveals the majesty in the beginning uh, genesis 1 1 in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth and so we, we see that unfolding and and he he just continues to make these declarations uh, the heavens declare his glory uh, for instance he says uh, there in verse 4 that we should remember the wonders. Uh, his wonders should be remembered. And in, in Psalm 105, verse 5, Remember His wonders which He has done, His marvels and the judgments uttered by His mouth. And, and again, everything that, that came forth in creation came by the Word from His mouth. He spoke it and it came into existence. So remember His wonders which he has he has done now james boyce clarifies here that the, the greatness of his works the glory and majesty of his deeds and the unforgettable nature of his wonders are brilliantly displayed you cannot go anywhere in the world and not see the display of the glory of the lord and and the wonders that he has created wherever a person looks there is wonder in the heavens in the multitude and majesty of stars, in the mystery of quasars and black holes, in the very distribution and composition of the planets. There is wonder in the microcosm, the su in subatomic sub -at particles and neutrinos, in the cells of bodies, in the mind and in matter. There is mystery to all living things. And God is behind that. He is behind that mystery in terms of the wonders of its creation. Again, the psalmist, Psalm 19, David declaring there in, in verse 1 uh, and following, the heavens are telling of the glory of God. And their expanse is declaring the work 
of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there, wor- are there words. Their voice is not heard. In other words, we are seeing it displayed, and yet it is speaking volumes with regards to uh, the work of God and his handiwork and the glory of God and who he is as uh, the person of that handiwork. And then he goes on to say in verse 4, their line has gone out through all the earth and their utterance to the end of the world. In other words, there's not any place on this earth, on this world that you could go and not see it and understand its message. God has made his wonders and his creation to recognize his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature is what we see in Romans chapter 1. And yet there are people that have exchanged that. They have have not recognized that. They have willfully not given God glory for His handiwork and recognized God in creation. And Paul would say there in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against God. All ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in righteousness. And what are they suppressing? They're suppressing the truth about God and His glory. Instead of giving Him glory, they're exchanging the glory of the incorruptible God with their own and with that of creatures worshiping and honoring God. Create the created things and not the Creator. Why? Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and His divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. So as, as believers, as those who belong to God, we know. And and the wonders of creation become fuel for our worship when we see them that we declare the glory of the Lord and we give thanks and praise His name. But then the psalmist goes on to declare that the Lord is gracious and compassionate. And He's gracious and compassionate in this created world uh, even when, when we see there in verse 5, He has given food to those who fear Him. Now, we see that in terms of the context uh, that would take us back to the time that, that the first generation of Israel who had come out of Exodus, out of the, through the Exodus, uh, out of Egypt, uh, in, in the wilderness journey that God provided manna, heavenly bread, God provided that during their years that Israel spent wandering in the wilderness. Even Jesus in His teaching us in in how to pray, how to approach the Father in Matthew chapter 6. You know, He he teaches us to pray for our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And so He has given food to those who fear Him. Uh, And so we see that in terms of the context here. But then... We, we see uh, the, the turning point in the second half of verse 5. He will remember His covenant forever. And His covenant. His covenant is, 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 is the work that He uh, has accomplished in establishing uh, this relationship. Drawing and calling a people to Himself. He is the one that ratifies this covenant. He is the one who alone is faithful to establishing and keeping this covenant. And we see it there, for instance, the covenant with Abraham in in, in Genesis chapter 17, uh, verse 3, uh, Abram, Abraham fell, that is, Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made uh, you the father of a multitude of nations. In other words, that the covenant that he's establishing is not just for the the people, the distinct people that that would come through Isaac and then to Jacob known as Israel, but this covenant would be established uh, through Abraham uh, to a multitude of nations, including us. 
I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. One of the kings that would come forth from Abraham is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the Davidic king, the messianic king known as Jesus Christ. He says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Well, we find in Exodus chapter 2, you know, years, centuries later with regards to the arrival of Moses, That it came about that the Lord is hearing the people uh, of his people, Israel, the the Jews, the Hebrews, uh, that they are now captive slaves in in Egypt. Just as God had um, preordained and declared prophetically in Genesis chapter 15 that this, this was going to happen. But that God was going to bring them out of that. And, and we see this moment, this turning point uh, in terms of the covenant that God says that he will remember forever. He says there in Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 23. Uh, now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage. And they cried out and their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groanings, and guess what? God remembered his covenants with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what, that's what the psalmist is revealing here, uh, that you know, one of the reasons why that we praise the Lord, uh, not, not just simply because of the works of creation, but because of the work of redemption. This covenant love that God has that he will never forget, that he keeps and remembers his covenant forever. And so, you know, God is remembering his covenant in in the days of Moses, and he raises up Moses to lead his people Israel out um, out of uh, out of captivity and onto the land of promise, just as he promised. And then we see there in Psalm 105, verse 8 uh, and through 10, that he has remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded uh, to a thousand generations, the covenant with which he had made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac. Then he confirmed it to Jacob for a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant. And we know that that this would be ultimately fulfilled, that there's only one one man who who was not a son of man, but was the son of God. Uh, This son of God would come and he alone would be that covenant-keeping covenant. Faithful individual without sin, uh, keeping the commandments of God without, um, you know, swaying one way or the other. He, he continued faithfully in perfect obedience, even to the point of death on the cross. And the author of Hebrews describes uh, this ongoing covenant relationship that has been forged by God through Jesus Christ. The work of redemption that's on the cross through the blood of Christ. He says there in verse 11 of Hebrews 9 that but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, and that's, that's what we see in, in, uh, you know, there in Psalm 110. He is a priest in the, the order of Melchizedek. Um, so here is this Christ. He has appeared as a high priest of the good things to come. He entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, um, and, you know, that means he, when he entered into the throne, the tabernacle r- room of, of God, the, the real, not the copy that's here on earth, that when he died, rose again, and ascended, he went uh, to be with the Father uh, in his throne. Um, and then he goes on to say that, that this was not made with hands, and that is, that is not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves. But through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of flesh, how much more 
will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, cleanse you your conscience from dead works to serving the living God. For this reason, He is the mediator of a new covenant. And it's a covenant that God remembers forever. So that, since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the in, in, in eternal inheritance. In other words, we find forgiveness for our sins. The transgressions that we have committed, that all have committed even under the first covenant, but now this new covenant has come and has been ratified by God through the giving of the sacrifice of His Son, the shedding of His blood, which brings about the, you know, the forgiveness of sin, uh, repentance, being reconciled with God so that we might praise and lift up His name and walk in fellowship with Him. The works of the Lord are powerful. And He has made known to His people the power of His works. And Moses talked about that. He sang a, a, a hymn. He wrote a, a hymn in, in Exodus 18 after the Exodus, after coming through uh, the Red Sea and seeing God handle uh, Pharaoh uh, and his army that he, he sings this song with the people in Exodus chapter 18. Uh, then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord and said, I will sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider has he has hurled into the sea. He's talking about, you know, his destruction of the, the army of, of Pharaoh. The Lord is my strength and song, and He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise Him. My Father's God, and I will extol Him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is His name. Pharaoh, Pharaoh's chariots and His army He has cast into the sea, and the choices of His officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The, deep, the deeps cover them. Uh, they went... They went down in the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O oh Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O oh Lord, shatters the enemy. Enemy. So in, in terms of the context, uh, when, when he says he has made known there in verse 6, his, made known to his people the power of his works, this, this re act of redemption, this work of redemption and delivering them from Egypt, this is what uh, they would have been thinking about. But there were, there's a, a, a work of redemption that was yet to come. And that was to come, as, as we see in Psalm 110, through the Davidic king, the Messianic king. It was a work of redemption um, that, that Isaiah would describe an almost explicit detail in Isaiah 53 about his death and how he took his, our sins upon himself. You see, uh, the works of the Lord are powerful. We need to remember them. We need to study them. Why? Not only the works of creation, but the works of redemption. This fuels heart-driven um, worship to the Lord. As we, we love Him, we, we thank Him, we praise Him with thankful, thankfulness with all of our hearts. That He has made known to His people the power of His works. He has made known uh, this power through giving them the, the heritage of the nations. And, and again, it, we, we looked at that from... Revelation eleven fifteen that when you know, we see the nations of the earth, uh, the kingdom, the kingdom of this earth will be given to uh, the, become the kingdom of the Son of God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and we belong to Him. So what belongs to Him belongs to us. And he goes on to say that the, the works of His hands are truth and justice. That is, the Lord acts faithfully and righteously towards His people and with justice and impartiality to all mankind. As the Word of God is the Word of truth, so all His works are the works of truth. Why? Because He, he speaks, He declares, He decrees, and they, you know, the world comes into existence or uh, the, the things that, that are there, they, they uh, exist in terms of, of His Word. Salvation exists because of God. Because of His Word. And he goes on to say that all His precepts are sure. They are upheld forever and ever. They are performed in truth and righteousness. And as Spurgeon rightly affirms, all His commandments are sure. All that has a, 
ha, that all that he has appointed is or decreed shall surely stand. When, when he says in, in Romans chapter 8 that there's nothing that will separate us from the love of God, you can take that word all the way into the kingdom. That he will keep that word because his, his decreed word shall surely stand. And, and Spurgeon goes on to say that his precepts, which he has proclaimed, shall be found worthy of our obedience. For surely they are founded in justice and are meant for our lasting good. He is no fickle despot commanding one thing one day and another the next. But his commands remain absolutely unaltered. Their necessity equally unquestionable. Their excellence permanently proven. And their reward eternally secure. And so when we think about the word of the Lord, the works of his hands are truth and justice. And they, they stand because he stands. His word stands forever. And there in verse 9, again, ultimately, um, as we have been looking at this portion, he has sent redemption to his people. The Lord has sent redemption to his people. When they were in Egypt, he sent not only a deliverer, but an actual deliverance. They came out. At times they doubted, they questioned, they rebelled. And yet God redeemed them despite even their own lack of belief. They sent, God sent not only a deliverer, but, but an actual deliverance. He not only sent a redeemer, but a complete redemption. And we have experienced that, brothers and sisters, in Christ. As, as Paul writes the Colossian church there in, verse, uh, in chapter 1, verse 13, for He rescued us. From the domain of darkness, that is the domain of Satan and this world, this lost and fallen world. And he transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. That is eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the kingdom that we are a part of. The everlasting kingdom. And then he goes on to say in verse 14, in whom we have redemption. The forgiveness of sins. It says that He has ordained His covenant forever and His holy and awesome is His name. And His, again, His, his covenant, again, just constantly, his, his covenant is eternal. It is ordained by His Word eternally and holy and awesome is His name. No greater name. All of these truths concerning the works of the Lord both in creation and in redemption are fuel For our worship as we gather together. We don't gather here because we're, 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 we're looking for what's in it for me. We gather here because we belong to God. We gather here because He is everything and all. And he deserves everything and He is alone is worthy of our praise. And so He concludes there in verse 10. That the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we just see it over and over. Uh, Psalm 128, verse 1. How blessed is everyone who fears the Lord. Who walks in His ways. You know, to, to fear the Lord is to walk in His ways. And His ways are His Word. So to walk in His Word. Proverbs 14, 26. In the fear of the Lord there is strong confidence. And in, in, in his children will have refuge. Why? Because Psalm 46 begins, um, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. He is our stronghold. He is our confidence, the fear of the Lord. You rest in him. You revere him. You honor him. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Proverbs 14, 27, the one that one may avoid the snares of death. In other words, in Christ. Again, you know, the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The fear of the Lord. Fear Him. Draw near to Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. Or Proverbs 19.23. Uh, the fear of the Lord leads to life. So that the one may sleep satisfied, untouched by evil. 
The fear of the Lord is the key. Uh, What we find in these scriptures, what we find in Psalm 111, is that the fear of the Lord is the key to what life is all about. That God is what life is all about. And that's why Paul would would end um, Psalm or Romans chapter eleven verse thirty six with one of my favorite verses in the Bible: "For from Him, and through Him, and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever." And Amen. He goes on to say there at the second half of verse ten that a good understanding have all. Those who do his commandments and Job would would write about this in Job 28, 28, he says uh, to man, he said, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom and to depart from evil is understanding. In other words, the wisdom of the Lord affects how our lives, I mean, it it preserves our life, it it guides our lives. That wisdom um, uh, enables us to walk away, to depart from evil. Why? Because we have been instructed by The wisdom of the Lord and the fear. The fear of the Lord is wisdom. And that good understanding have all those who do and keep His commandments. And keeping His commandments. You know, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. And that's why we keep His commands. Because we love Him. Because He has changed our lives. He has saved us and redeemed us and brought us into His kingdom, made us citizens of His kingdom, and therefore His praise endures forever. His kingdom is forever. And so as we close this morning, here's an invitation. J. Ligon Duncan writes, Worship is the great battle of our lives. Everyone worships, but they're... Here's the problem. We're so tempted to worship idols of our own making, to set our affections on things other than other than and lower than God and to worship them as the supreme thing. And so worship really is the battle of all our lives. Who will we worship? And the Lord is calling us here in Psalm 111 from the very outset, worship me. Praise the Lord. Worship the Lord with all your hearts is what the psalmist is saying. As we consider the worship of the Lord, worship the Lord with all your hearts. And the only way that you're going to do that is through salvation in Jesus Christ. That you would be redeemed. That you would turn to Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. To know that He is the one who has, by His redemptive work, redeemed you from your sins on the cross. So, worship the Lord with all your heart. Remember, study the works of the Lord. And and there's no greater work in all of creation than the redemptive work of God through His Son on the cross for our sins. And not only did He die for our sins, but He rose again from the grave so that we might have everlasting life and that we would know. We would know the fear of the Lord. We would know Him and fear Him. What a blessing. What a blessing. Paul would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that he was... um, talking about reconciliation. And and, and just look at uh, verse 18 and following. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of uh, reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And He has committed us to the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. And what did God do? He made Him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Lord, we just pray in the name of Jesus Christ that You would just move in the lives of, the, of Your church, 
that God, that you would embolden us and strengthen us and that you would, through even this, these words from Psalm 111 today, through the works of creation, the works of redemption, and your glory and, and, and all the, the things that, that are set before us here in this text, uh, that we should remember and that we should study, Lord, that, that by these means that we would be fueled in our passion and our heart to worship and lift up your name more and more every day. That as we gather corporately, Father God, that, that you would be the direct object of our worship. And we are coming to declare your name and lift your name on high. And we give you praise. We give you praise uh, for the, the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. And we lift up the name of Jesus, who is our king, who is our Lord. He is our redeemer. And we thank you, Father God, for your Holy Spirit that helps us to understand these things. And it dwells us. And it inspires us in our worship. Convicts us where we fall short of your glory. And Lord, we just thank you for the forgiveness of sin. And I pray that, that people would hear this and turn to you in faith. And praise your name. All the days of their life. It's in the name of Jesus Christ I pray. Amen.